So David Brooks, a columnist for the New York Times, uh, earlier this year wrote an article back in March titled, Pandemics Kill Compassion 2. You may not like who you're about to become. He goes on to say that some disasters like hurricanes, earthquakes can actually bring people together. Uh, while pandemics usually drive people apart, as a primary virtue of a pandemic is social distancing. He lists a few other writers' accounts of earlier plagues, uh, one documenting the 1665 London epidemic who said, this was a time when everyone's private safety lay so near them that they had no room to pity the distresses of others. The danger of immediate death to ourselves took away all bonds of love and all concern for one another. Fear drives people in these moments. One Yale historian argues that pandemics actually hold up a mirror to society and force us to ask basic questions. What is possible imminent death trying to tell us? Where is God in all of this? What's our responsibility to one another? Brooks then goes on to point out a puzzling feature from the 1918 pandemic in America, one which the Philadelphia head of emergency pleaded for help in, in taking care of sick, for people to take care of sick children, and nobody answered outside of medical professionals. When it was over, the, pan, the, the pandemic, people didn't talk about it. There were very few books or plays written about it. Roughly 675,000 Americans lost their lives to the flu. Give you an idea, compared to World War I, there was 53,000 people who were lost in battle. Yet it left almost no conscious cultural mark. Perhaps it's because people didn't like who they had become. It was a shameful memory and therefore suppressed. So my question for you this morning, who are you becoming during this time? When we will look back on this time, will we talk about it? Will we look back at a time where we do in fact like who we became? Maybe the greatest challenge we have as both a culture, but specifically today as the people of God, is division over differences and disagreements. See, we've been on a trajectory of social distancing well before the plague through not just social media, but also the incessant rate at which we live our lives and which makes no room for others. People increasingly are being less and less treated as the humans that they are through personal interaction, and more and more as the 140 words they post about their partisanship, their take on injustice, or their yard signs in support of any particular group or organization. In a long thread the other day uh, that I was looking at on Facebook, a Christian wrote this. The fact is, we're not one nation any longer. It's time we all recognize that. It's time for secession. It's time we divide the nation up. I'm tired of this BS. I don't want Dems and left-wingers as neighbors any longer, and they don't want me. Let's split things up and go our separate ways. My friends, this is a statement that has lost all compassion. You may have not gone this far in vocalizing it, but how are you doing with compassion for others in this time? your neighbor who's clearly going to vote differently, differently than you, your family member who so easily angers you when talking about injustices, the person in your church who has a different take on COVID and the government's handling of it, the person on Facebook you knew from 15 years ago who has a bent towards harmful conspiracy theories. Do you like who you are becoming during this time? And this is a question I would encourage you to take seriously this morning is, I believe it matters, and it feels like right now, especially for the people of God, it matters more than ever. And today we're starting our new sermon series called That They May Be One, based on the end of a prayer from Jesus known as his farewell discourse. Jesus ends up talking with his friends, and then scripture tells us that he looked upwards towards heaven and began to pray. We're going to pick up in the story uh, at the, the end of this prayer. And as I read it now, I, I want you to keep in mind that he's actually praying for you. This is his prayer for you and for me and for us. In John 17, verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, 
Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. The whole of this prayer in John 17 is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. It's prayed the night before he dies. In so many ways, this is a deathbed confession. Three times that all of them may be one. That they may be one as we are one. So that they may be brought to complete unity. In your interactions with others, let's say other Christians right now who disagree with you, are you pursuing unity with them? Now, I don't know if you caught the end of the prayer by Jesus there, but he says, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me, even as you have loved me. The world will know that God is pursuing them and that God is love if you and I are one. Our neighbors will know that God is pursuing them and God is love if Midtown is one. The city of Fresno will know that God is pursuing them and God is love if those who believe and those who will believe are brought to complete unity. You feel the weight behind Jesus's prayer. You feel the invitation and the responsibility being held in tension there. The unity that you and I have had as followers of Jesus is what gives a compelling reason for faith in Christ. Our prayer is that through these five weeks, we seriously ask the question, who am I becoming during this time? And this is important because the cultural waters that we are swimming in are only leading to division. There's no more middle and polarization is only continuing to grow. If we just float with the current, we're not taking Jesus's prayer seriously. We have to grab a paddle and begin swimming upstream. So right now, if you were to allow God just to search your heart, are you pursuing unity? In Jesus's prayer, we just read, unity being a reflection of, of the eternal oneness of the Father and the Son, of Jesus and God. And it's through the lives of the believers in the world that this gets expressed. It's harmony in relationship with God and with others. The hard part about unity? Well, everything. (laughs) Unity does not come without difference. Difference of opinions, difference of lifestyles, differences of race and ethnicity, difference of life experience and worldviews, difference of sports teams. Like the list is endless. And oftentimes unity looks like getting others to change their ways, to see things the way I want them to, to begin acting as the Christian or the person that I think they should be. Unity is most often viewed through the lens of my control. You know what I'm talking about because you're right, right? Isn't that the way it goes? Rich Velotis, a pastor in Queens, New York, actually the most diverse neighborhood in America, uh, says that when engaging in polarizing issues, the follower of Jesus would do well to ask, Am I uneasy with this perspective because it runs contrary to Jesus's life and message? Or am I uneasy with this perspective because it challenges the long held assumptions that I've carried? Now, what I don't want you to hear this morning is that when pursuing unity, we don't share our convictions. We don't stand up to injustice. We don't have healthy boundaries with relationships. We do all of these yet so much more. What I am saying this morning is that if we so desperately want to see change, we want to to see others change, things change around us, society change, it's going to require unity. And here's a thought for this morning. If you want to see change, choose compassion. If you want to see change, choose compassion. Brenda Salter McNeil in her book, Roadmap to Reconciliation, She explains that that true reconciliation, true community, comes only after a pseudo-community has been intersected with a crisis that sort of blows up the polite conversation. At some point, there's either a disruption or people finally start to get comfortable enough to say what they really feel. And that's the beginning of true community. Yes, even difference of opinions and worldviews. We as a nation are in a massive disruption right now. It can be uncomfortable, it can be confronting, it can be disagreeable, it can be just horrible at times. It's something that most people run away from. 
It wouldn't be healthy to live in it all the time, but it's a part of the process toward building a real profound community, real unity. We need to stay in the room with one another right now. And when it gets more difficult is exactly when it's time to stay longer. So I think the spirit led question of our time is not when this will be over, but God, what are you doing right now in and through me? You see, culture tells us to look outward, to blame others, to change and conform the people, the, the, the people that we disagree with. That if, if we want to see change, they need to change. But all I see this breeding right now is hate and anger and division. And yes, even in the church. For this to happen, for us Christians to stay in the room with one another and pursue a true, authentic community, we must be willing to grow in compassion. If you want to see change, choose compassion. The Potential Project found through their research of over 15,000 leaders that oftentimes empathy and compassion are confused with one another. They even go as far to say that empathy is dangerous for leaders as it's the brain's tendency to identify with those who are close to us, close in proximity, close in uh, familiarity, close in kinship. And then when, when we empathize with those close to us, those who are not close or are different seem threatening to us. They say that with compassion, we actually take a step away from the emotion of empathy and ask ourselves, how can we help in spite of differences and disagreement? See, compassion is how we move towards others who are different than us, who, how we pursue unity with those we disagree with. And I think the early church got this. Paul, a church planner a couple thousand years ago, and who wrote a good amount of your New Testament Bible, wrote a letter to the Colossian church, a church made up primarily of Gentiles. Those were who, those who were adopted into the Jewish faith through Jesus and is massively different religiously, culturally, ethnically, racially, and they have just been divided over these teachings. But this is just, a, everything is different about these people. And he says in chapter 3, starting in verse 11, Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen, chosen people, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Did you catch that? In the midst of all their differing worldviews and disagreements, clothe yourself with compassion, meaning choose to put on compassion in a divided world for the sake of unity. Are you choosing to lead with compassion when you discuss any big topics right now with other people? Or are you trying to prove your truth, your way of viewing the world, getting others to conform to the way you think they should be living out their life and their faith? Let's list them. Your family members, the one you disagree with most, are you choosing to lead with compassion? The neighbor who's, again, clearly gonna be voting for the other president, are you choosing to lead with compassion? How about the person on Facebook who just drives you absolutely insane and you argue with constantly, are you choosing to lead with compassion? We can go on and on, mask or no mask, injustice and defunding, defunding. The amount of culture shifting discussions right now seems unprecedented and it's ripping the church apart. Do I see some good in that? Absolutely but only if we ask the question, God, what are you doing in this time? And then asking, who am I becoming through this? Now, speaking of putting on compassion, there's so many examples in the story of God and his people. Well, I want us to look at one in the beginning. The creation narrative in the beginning of your Bible, Genesis 1 to 3, we see God make the whole earth and all that fills it. We see God and humankind in perfect harmony with one another. Humankind eats of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the one thing that they weren't supposed to do, and they cause separation from their relationship with God and usher in all of evil to, man, to humankind. 
God then lays down the consequences for their actions and he exiles them from the garden as to keep them from furthering their desire to become God. So it's all bad, right? Well, hold on. Right before he kicks them out and right after he lays down the consequences, let's check out Genesis 3, starting in verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Why would God do something on their behalf here? Theologians have differing opinions on what exactly they were clothed clothed with, but one thing that often comes up is, why clothe them? Adam and Eve, humankind, literally just ushered in all of evil, all of pain, all of brokenness, of suffering, of injustice. Everything that you cannot stand in the people that you disagree with, both small and big. In this very moment, humankind has completely gone against God and his will for them. I cannot think of a bigger moment of division where God would want to change them, control them, get them to see the way he sees it because he's right. But what's his response? To prepare them for exile. To prepare them for exile in which God never stops pursuing a relationship with them. To prepare them for the possibility of unity. Do you see the compassion here? Amidst the difference, the disagreement, the division, God offers compassion. They are now clothed with what they need to pursue unity, both with God and with others, though the cultural currents they swim in lead to division. So what garments are you offering others with whom you disagree? Those who have a different worldview. Those who have different life experiences that brought them to where they are today. How are you offering compassion, which communicates your pursuit for unity? The same compassion that you were offered by God. We see the fullness of this compassion amongst difference and disagreement in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. If you're here this morning and maybe you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus yet, this is the good news. And as you've watched from the outside and potentially seen the people of God more divided than you have united, I pray that the truth of who Jesus is and the unity that he desires in his church is the representation of the unity that he desires in relationship with you. And maybe the best way for this unity to be revealed to you is that in your life is to make the decision to follow Jesus today. And for all of us, This unity is only possible through the proximity of Jesus, the act of a compassionate God. So church, a few ideas this week of how we can grow in our compassion. If you engage on social media, what does it look like for you to choose compassion? When just posting and firing back is like throwing rocks over the noise of the rapids, How can you actually invite others into a conversation in which you might listen first? People want to be heard. Because to be heard is to be loved in so many ways. Maybe you just need to limit yourself on social or get off completely. See, it's harder to see the garment of skin which God offered people when we never actually have the chance to step in close enough to listen to it, to see it, to touch it, to feel it. Second, who in your physical life, I guess we got to make that distinction now, do you have a hard time with? You can never agree and want to avoid the person. What would it look like to actually reach out to them and lead with compassion? Call them, text them, grab a coffee together, social distance, whatever you need to do. How can you lead with compassion? If you don't feel like either of these, Pray for someone that you hate. I said, okay, if not hate, you despise someone that you see as your enemy. If you can't think of anyone, pray for the president voting for And no, not that they view everything the way you do. Pray for them as a human, as someone whom God has given a garment of skin and is compassionately pursuing. Because more than ever in a divided world, I don't think the question is, how can I change others? But how is God changing me through this time? How am I becoming a person of compassion? Because the reality, you can't argue enough to change someone. 
but you can open yourself up, oh my God changing you. And in this, I believe you'll begin to see the change that your heart desires. If you want to look back at this time, and like the person that you actually become, choose compassion in the pursuit of unity. So with that, let's go into an act of unity into our time of communion this morning with Holly.